um, I don't want to take an evening to get acquainted, okay? So we're all acquainted. I'm Raymond. I come from New Brunswick. It is colder there than it is here, so it's not complaining, okay? We're acquainted. We got snow on the ground already. Oh, my goodness. Uh, you can feel sympathy for me right now. That's your cue. Um, but let, let's uh, let's just get right into the Word of God tonight. Amen. And let's let the Lord speak. It is an honor to be here with you, with your pastors, and uh, with your leadership. I'm looking forward to spending some time with uh, all of you volunteers tomorrow. I uh, approach our subject tonight with a, I guess, a little bit of a special burden I spent in my travels today. I had a, a layover in the city of Toronto, and I spent about an hour on the phone with a young man, um, a good, good young man, a friend of mine. He doesn't live where I live, but he's a good friend. Um, struggling with some of these issues because uh, the way our culture is today and the way temptation is today. And uh, so I approach this with a little bit of a special uh, burden tonight. Uh, he's going to be fine. He's a good man. But the devil is so sinister and so <coughs> evil and he's pushing in on our culture. North Carolina is still uh, quite a bit like New Brunswick. We're a little sheltered from some of the horrifying trends we see in morality and in culture, but they are coming our way. And we need to be on guard. And if there ever was a moment when the church should stand up strong, if everybody else can speak out, we can speak out. If everybody else can have their opinion, we can have it. We're, we're going to read lots of scripture tonight, so I, I won't make you uh, stand for text, but I would like you to stand uh, and pray with me right now. Would you lift up your hands and let's ask the Lord to speak here tonight. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the honor and the privilege of standing in this pulpit with these great people who obviously love you, love to worship you, love the house of God. They're so faithful. God, I pray that you would minister tonight. I pray that you would speak uh, your word through me. Allow me the privilege of getting out of the way and letting your word go forward. And uh, God, touch us here tonight. We need your touch. If we're going to live the way you want us to live and you've told us to live, we can't do it without you. We need your touch. So God, we're praying that your will be done here tonight and your kingdom come here tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. 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 Thank you for standing. You may be seated. Tonight I want to talk about a subject that is kind of terrifying for some people, even some religious people, even some Pentecostal styles of people, and it is the subject of holiness. When you say that word anymore, uh, people almost recoil in some circles. They feel like that's kind of a bad word. It's a word that makes people run the other way. It's a, a word that uh, keeps us from uh, reaching people or a word that keeps us from growing. And I would suggest to, do, to you that the exact opposite is true. Uh, the, the darker our culture becomes, the more wickedness abounds and the more perversity becomes mainstream. Eventually, you watch it happen, eventually, out of the cesspool of sin, people will get so tired of that and so tired of the brokenness and so tired of all of the heartache and pain that comes with lifestyles that uh, thwart the purpose and the plan of God in their life. And they won't come in a mass. They'll come one at a time. And they will crawl out of that and come looking for hope. And when they come looking for hope, they're going to be looking for somebody that has something different, something better, uh, something that, that helps them and doesn't hurt them. That's us. We have the word of God. We have the experience that God has given us. I don't think holiness is a bad word. In fact, if I read my holy Bible, I find a holy God. And I find he gives me a holy spirit. And I find that my ultimate destination is New Jerusalem, the holy city. And I find that we're called to be a holy people. Yes. And so I don't think this is a word or a concept or a subject that we should be afraid of or we should run from. I think we should let it challenge us 
where it needs to challenge us, teach us where it needs to teach us. But at the end of the day, if I'm filled with the Holy Ghost, then I need to be a holy vessel. Yes. If I'm serving a holy God, I need to be a holy vessel. If I'm obeying a holy Bible, I need to be a holy vessel. Now, the word holiness is not just kind of a standalone word that, uh, you know, just pops up out of nowhere. It's connected to some of the most ancient concepts in the scripture. Uh, if you read in 1 Peter chapter 1, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15 and verse 16, uh, Peter writes and he says this, But as God, which has called you, is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Now, the King James Bible is the most word-for-word, -word accurate translation that we have. But it was written uh, 404 years ago. And so there are words that change their meaning, not in the Bible's meaning, but in the English language. And 404 years ago, the word conversation didn't just mean talking. It meant every way in which you converse with the world around you. That's conversation. So the closest word that we would have today to the word conversation from 404 years ago is the word lifestyle. It's every way in which people communicate with you and you with them. It's every way in which you act and interact with the world around you. So what Peter is really saying is, as God who has called you is holy, you need to be holy. It's a command for you to be holy in all manner of lifestyle. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. And now here's the good news. If God gives a command, there's power in the command to help fulfill the command. When God says, let there be light, the very next thing that happens in the first chapter of your Bible is there's light. Because when God gives a command, there's power in the command to fulfill the command. Last chapter of your Bible, God says, if anybody's a thirst, let them come. When God gives a command, there's power in the command to help fulfill the command. So when God says, let them come, he's speaking to the world, the flesh, the devil, every kind of opposition. And if you want to serve God, there's no demon in hell that can keep you from serving God. Because the command is, let them come. holy. He's not giving us an impossible task. When the, God gives us a command, be ye holy as I am holy, there's power in that command to help fulfill that command. Now, holiness is tied to ancient concept. Holiness means separation. By definition, it does. Holiness means withdrawal, like the high priest the holy high priest of Israel would withdraw from Israel and he would withdraw from the other priests and he would go behind the veil into the holy of holies. Um, so holiness has a sense of pulling away from something. Holiness has the sense of being separate from something. And holiness is a synonym for the word sanctification. In your Bible, when you see the word sanctified or sanctification, holiness and sanctification are equivalent terms. To be sanctified is to be made holy. And, and so this is what we see in the Bible. This is not just kind of some word that the Pentecostals came up with a few decades ago and decided we were going to make a case and stake our claim on the word holiness. Holiness is one of the most ancient concepts in the word of God because anything God touched, anything God used, anything God set apart for his service, any vessels that were used in the temple, any human beings that uh, served in the temple, they had to go through all kinds of things to be set apart and made holy. And so when we flip into the New Testament, we're no longer one physical ethnic group, Israel, in one physical land, Israel, uh, with a physical covenant. We are now a spiritual people. The church is comprised of people from every language and tribe and tongue and nation and kindred. And so we come from every kind of nation. And our physical, uh, our, our promise is not a physical country. Israel was promised a land. 
This is your promised land. God said, if you're faithful to me, if you walk with me, Abraham, I'll give you the land. In fact, uh, Joshua, every place that the sole of your foot treads, I'll give it to you. And so that's God's promise. Uh, you know, some people read the Old Testament and they think, my goodness, um, it, it seems like God blessed all those people back then. Some of them were very wealthy. Some of them had huge holdings. I mean, their land holdings weren't a ranch. They were like, here's your country. And, and so they were wealthy people. God blessed them with physical, earthly promises. And, and now we come to the, the, the New Testament and people say, well, I, I don't have wealth and I don't have lands and I don't have everything that the patriarchs had. What's going on? I thought the New Testament was a better covenant. Well, hang on just a minute. In the New Testament, we don't have a physical country. We have a country that no man has yet seen yes. and no eye has yet beheld. And we right. are there. And we think any nation on this planet is a beautiful nation. You haven't seen heaven. That's right. Now, in the Old Testament, when God blessed his people, he gave them physical, earthly blessings of wealth and possessions. And Do you know the greatest blessing God gives us in the New Testament? Because we're a different people. We're not an earthly people. We're a heavenly people having an earthly experience. The greatest blessing God gives us is adversity. I can see you really like that. I was expecting people to run the aisles on that. Because when you go through trials and sorrow and trouble, do you know what it makes you do? It makes you think, there's got to be something better than this. I, I, man, I, I'm sad here. I, I'm lonely here. I'm hurting here. I'm sick in my body. I'm sick of my circumstances. And God says, bingo, you're not supposed to be here forever. There's a different country coming for you. You've got a different inheritance. And so if things are come here and it makes you look there, that's not a bad thing. And so God blesses us with those things and we don't even consider them a blessing, but they are. Because they keep us focused. This is not your final destination. I hope you have a wonderful life. I hope your family prospers. I hope you have a great retirement if you're in that age bracket. And I, I hope everything goes well for you. But don't you ever forget, this world is not my home. That's right. This, this is not where we're going. And so the big argument today against the concept of holiness is if we live according to the word of God and we're a holy people, we'll be different than everybody else. We'll be an oddity in the world. Uh, people will think we're weird. And, and people will think, well, what is that all about? And, and, and people might feel a little put off by our lifestyle of holiness. And if you could hear the words of God, he would say, that's exactly what I'm wanting for my people. Because first of all, holiness is a witness. It's like a billboard that you wear in your life. There's something different here. If you get tired of the ordinary, and if you get tired of the sin, and if you get tired of the world, there's something different over here. We wear holiness as a billboard. It's an advertisement saying, this is a different people. But it's even more than that. Israel has a saying, they still use it today. It comes from ancient times. It doesn't even come from modern Israel. It comes from ancient Israel, and they still say it today. More than Israel kept the Sabbath, the Sabbath kept Israel. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yes, the Jews kept the Sabbath. They honored God by setting apart that seventh day. They, they honored God by doing that. And, and they, they didn't do any work on that day. And there were all kinds of requirements. And they did that. And, and that set them apart as a people. No other people at that time did that. Nobody. It was just them. And, and so that distinguished them. And so you could accurately say the Jews kept the Sabbath. But heaven would have a different perspective. God would say... The Sabbath kept Israel. It put them in a category where they were different than everybody else. It literally built a barrier between them and the pagan nations around them. So much more than Israel was keeping the Sabbath, the Sabbath was actually keeping Israel. That's I would right. suggest to you tonight, as we kind of dive into our subject, that more than we keep Holiness standards. Holiness standards keep us. They put a fence around our young people. They put a barrier around our marriages. They put a protection around our home. And they put a wall of defense around your mind. You might think, I'm keeping these holiness standards under God. God would differ with you. He would say, no, those holiness standards are keeping you from the world. Just being able to run shot through your life and mess you up. It's an hour before
before service tonight, I was in those uh, wonderful uh, guest quarters over there, and a friend of mine sent me an article, and I, I read it. And the reason that this friend sent it to me is because I had been uh, in, in this state and, and preaching, teaching, and uh, this pastor's wife, she said, um, I wanted to send you this article, Brother Woodward, because you said it wasn't just going to be the Supreme Court decision. You said it wasn't just going to be uh, the issues of uh, gay marriage. You said it was going to be more than that. So she sent me this article. And this article is about several different groups all vying for attention and equality in America right this moment. The first group is transgender. And we heard a lot about that. But transgender is just the tip of the iceberg. There's also transageism. And the article in particular that she sent me is a 52-year-old man. He's basically my age. And he's living as a six-year-old girl. He dresses up like a six-year-old girl. He has parents who adopted him as a six-year-old girl. Of course, of course, of course, in the filth of the world, he has a sexual relationship with his father. There are other children in the home, and they relate to him as if he was a six-year-old girl. That's trans-ageism. Then there's trans-race, where somebody literally decides, I'm not the race that God made me. I want to be a different race, and we have to accept that. And then there's trans-species, where somebody literally thinks, well, I'm a dog. And they crawl around on all fours, and they live like a dog, and they act like a dog, and we're supposed to accept that. And if you think that's a funny joke, it's not a funny joke. Watch your media. It's going to be coming our way. And there's all kinds of stuff. There's even uh, a, a, another uh, transabled community. We've heard of disabled people, and that is something that we uh, respect and we try to uh, make convenient and we make our buildings accessible because we honor people who have disabilities. But there are people who are uh, transabled is what they call it. Uh, one lady decided that uh, she should have been born blind. So she actually had her psychologist work with her to pour bleach in her eyes to make her blind because she wanted to be disabled. She was transabled. I've got good working eyes, but I was born disabled, so I want to be blind. Other people have literally gone to physicians and requested to have limbs perfectly functioning, good limbs cut from their body because I think I was... Uh, born with two legs, but I, I want to be uh, crippled. I, I want to be disabled. I was born in the wrong body. Now here's what the world has backed themselves into a corner on. Because if you lower the bar of God's rule in one place, how do you now say we can't allow any of that? How do you now say that's crazy? You can't say that's crazy when you kicked out the morals from under our culture. And that's where we're headed. You say that's terrible. That's horrible. What in the world are we going to do? I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to keep preaching the gospel. Then we're going to keep living for God. Then we're going to keep being a light. Then we're going to keep standing strong. Because if they do that revival in the first century under the pagan Roman Empire, we can certainly have revival in North Carolina in the 21st century. And it doesn't matter what the courts do, what the governments do, what the banks do, what the culture does, what Hollywood does. It doesn't matter. We can still have a great revival under all of that. Hallelujah! Yes. Right. Somebody lift up your hands and give God thanks. America and Canada and all 
these other nations that much, we're going to come out fighting. We're, we're not fighting people. Our, our war is not against flesh and blood, but we are going to war against the spirit of the age. Yes. Now, I'm not trying to make points or lose points with this next statement, but the best way to fight the spirit of the age is not getting on a soapbox in the town square and hollering at everybody that you disagree with. That's I'm not right. saying we shouldn't have a clear sound. I'm not saying that uh, we, we, we shouldn't speak up. But we need to be known for what we're for more than known for what we're against. That's right. We are for Jesus. Yeah. We are for marriage. Yes. We are for family. Yes. We are for so many wonderful things. And without exception, every one of those things bless lives. They don't curse lives. That's like right. all the cesspool of garbage floating around in our culture. That's right. Mm -hmm. And so if there ever was a time when we need to stand up with a humble spirit, not a proud, arrogant spirit, not better than everybody else spirit, but just stand up and say, you know what? Uh, that's your opinion. This is my opinion. God's commandments are not grievous unto me. If the psalmist David could say that in the Old Testament, God, your commandments don't upset me. Your commandments are not grievous to me. And if John could say it in the New Testament in one of his epistles, your commandments, God, are not grievous to me. Then, my goodness, I can stand up and say, God's rules, if you want to call them that, I understand that they're to bless me. I understand that they're to protect me. Parents that are in this place, you did not run up and down the street when your kids were in school. Hollering at everybody else's kids, do your homework. <laughs> you told your own kids, do your homework. Why? Because they're your kids. And you love them and you want them to amount to something. My goodness, we even have pets. You don't put everybody else's pet in a yard on a chain. You put your pet in the yard on a chain. Why? Because it's your pet. And things we love and things we cherish, we protect. We put boundaries around. And so when God looks at his people, he doesn't want you to be destroyed. He doesn't want you to be bound in addictions. He doesn't want you to be uh, living a double life so that in your mind you're living one way and in the secret places of your heart you're living one way and then in public you're a different way. That's so dysfunctional. That kills you. That's worse than cancer. That's worse than any disease that can eat you alive. That, that's just horrid to live a double life in your mind. And so God, he gives us these principles and these commandments and they're not given to bind us. They're not given to burden us. They are given up to bless us and protect us. That's right. One of my teachers in Bible school, a great man of God, self-educated, he's gone on to heaven many years ago now. His name was Allison Post and uh, Sister Gleason, who just became our uh, international ladies director for the UPCI. This was her dad, great man of God, and I cherished my uh, relationship with Brother Post. He taught me in Bible school. He taught many things. I still have his uh, Leviticus notes that he typed one finger at a time on an old manual typewriter, and they're a treasure to me. Uh, he taught us one statement that stuck with me maybe more than anything else he taught. He, he said, salvation is the most elastic word in the Bible. And what he meant by that is salvation covers the point from my new birth to when I go to heaven. And he would explain it like this. I was saved. I'm being saved. And I will be saved. I was saved from the penalty of my sin when I was born again. But every day that I live, I'm being saved from the power of sin over me. And someday when the rapture happens, look out, devil, I'm going to be saved from the very presence of sin. Yes. Nobody can ever tempt me or hurt me in hell. That's right. So Brother Post would say, and it, it, it was just uh, this brilliant thing, so simple, but so profound. I was saved, I'm being saved, and I will be saved. Salvation is the most elastic word in the Bible. It covers, the, it stretches to cover my whole life. Now, now, the theologians would say, I was justified. When I'm born again, I'm justified. My sins are washed away. They're taken away. And I am made just as if I would never sinned. For me, that was when I was 12 years old. Uh, that has been over 40 years ago now for me. Uh, so, so that's a long time ago. I've got to tell you that I need more 
than just a fond memory of my new birth experience. That's right. I need Jesus every day. So yes. when I start living for God, which for me now has been a 41 year and counting experience since the age of 12, I move from justification, where the penalty of my sin is taken away. I move into a process that God calls sanctification. And Paul talks about this in his epistles, being sanctified. And, and, and sanctification is that stage where every day that I live, I am being saved from the power of sin. The penalty of my sins was gone when I was 12 years old. When I got baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost, when I was 12, I was just as saved at that moment as I am right now. Just as much part of the family of God then as I am right now. Let, let me tell you, if you're new at the Pentecostals of Lumberton, let, let me tell you something. You're just as saved when you experience the new birth, just as ready for heaven, just as much part of the family of God, uh, just as much one of God's children as somebody that's been living for God for 50 or 60 years. Uh, you're, you're part of the family. You're born into the family by what we call the new birth. So you're part of the family. But here's the thing. Uh, people say, Jesus loves you just the way you are. True, but incomplete. He loves you just the way you are, but he loves you way too much to leave you that way. That's right. My goodness. We, we don't bring babies into the world and just abandon them. Okay, you're born. See ya. <laughs> we nurture them and we, we help them and we teach them and they grow. And God's family is not a dysfunctional family. So as you move into this process called sanctification, it is God's will that you grow. And the whole idea of sanctification is you're becoming more like Jesus every day that you live. If you've lived for God for 10 years and you're not more like Jesus now than you were 10 years ago, you're doing it wrong. If you don't have more control over your temper, something's wrong. If you're not conquering uh, sins and hidden sins and, and, and things in your flesh uh, and, and you've lived for God for 10 years and you're not closer to Jesus and more set apart to Jesus now than you were then, something's broken down. You need a trip to an altar. You need a good touch of the Holy Ghost because God wants you to grow up. He wants people that mature and they get strong and then instead of the devil always doing damage to you, now you turn the tables and you go out and do some damage to the devil to all the junk you have in your life. That's the will of God for the people. And then finally, someday we experience what the theologians call glorification. We go into rapture, glorified body, no more temptation. Now here's, here's my point with all of that. Guess where we're living right now? We're living in this middle stage called sanctification. Uh, we've been born again. We're in God's family. We haven't been raptured yet. Some of you are so angelic looking, it looks like you've been raptured, but you haven't been raptured. You're still here. So we're in this middle stage called sanctification. Sanctification means holiness, and holiness means sanctification. So here's the deal. You've got to get this one. The whole purpose of living for God is to be made into his image. The whole purpose of living for God is is to grow in the Lord. The whole purpose of living for God is to be made holy as He is holy. That's, That's the purpose right. of all these years. And so if you're in the church, God's wanting you to grow. He loves you when you're a little new convert. He loves you when you're a babe in Christ. But it is possible, and I've seen it, maybe you have, I'm sure you don't have these people in North Carolina. But we have them in Canada, and we will ship you some postage paid free of charge, if you would like. You've met people around churches that grew old, but they never grew up. They just kind of got sour. It's like milk that stayed too long out on the cupboard or something. They just got sour. They, they, they didn't get sweet like Jesus. They didn't get mature. They didn't get more godly. They just got ugly. I can see by the look on your face. Nobody in North Carolina. So I'll just talk about New Brunswick for a while. And, 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 and they kind of around. But they're not the ones that are sweet and loving and want the church to grow and reaching for new people. They're just kind of cranky. That's not God's will. God's will is the more you grow up in the Lord, the more like Jesus you become. Now, I, I know I'm uh, addressing... <clears throat> A seasoned group of saints. You're different ages, different stages, but 
it's very obvious from the church, it's very obvious from your leadership, it's even very obvious from your worship and the presence of God in this room. It's very obvious to me that you're serious about living for God, and I thank God for that. But here's your job. Paul said exactly the opposite of what most people say today. If you follow Christian Christianity a little bit today, here's what you'll hear leaders say in the wild, wacky world of Christianity. You'll hear them say, don't look at me, look at Jesus. Don't look at me, look at Jesus. Don't follow me, follow Jesus. It sounds so spiritual. It's just a cover so they can do whatever they want. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. He said in another place, be followers of me. Be imitators of me. And so that's the whole job of seasoned saints. You are the older siblings in the family of God. If the church is to grow and new babies are to be born into the kingdom of God, they're going to be like your kids. See, God's family is not a dysfunctional family. In your family, the little tiny kids, they looked at the bigger kids and they learned from them. That's right. As parents, that was always the joke. We always thought we were teaching our kids. And a lot of times it was their older siblings that were teaching them way more than we were teaching them. Mm -hmm. Our second born, Matthew, we despaired that he was ever going to talk. Because he had an older sister, three years born before him, Emily. And Emily was born talking, almost. She loved to chatter, and she loved to play to everything that walked in shoe leather and some things that didn't. And so when Matthew was born three years later, Emily was already everybody's little second mother. And we didn't think Matthew was ever going to talk because Emily did all his talking for him. <laughs> She, she said, Matthew wants a cookie. Actually, Matthew wants two cookies. He wants to give me one, and he wants one. <laughs> Finally, Matthew started talking in self-defense. Okay? And he's fine, and he still talks, and he's actually pretty good at it. But he watched his older sibling, and I think that's how he finally figured it out. She gets what she wants when she talks. I better start learning this behavior. <laughs> think with me. In Mom. the wonderful family of God. How does a new convert that's coming from our world that's so wicked and so anti-God, how do they learn how to serve God properly? If somebody that comes in from religion and all they've ever had as far as God or church is concerned is traditional religion and they've gone to church and they've never really, really, really worshipped with abandon in their life and they've sung some of the same songs that we sing but they've never felt the touch of the Holy Ghost because anything like that would be frowned upon where they go to church and, and, and they come in. How are they supposed to learn to live as an apostolic? I'll tell you how. By watching all of you. You're the older brothers and sisters in the house. Your role in building this church is so incredibly important because you are the pattern. How does a new convert learn that they should raise their hands? Yeah, maybe they'll come across the scripture and start doing it. You know what's way more likely? They're going to look around this building during any given service and they're going to see hands lifted. And they're going to think, oh, that's okay here. I can do that. I feel that. I want to do that. How are they going to learn that they should be faithful to church? They're going to learn by looking for you every time they're here. And when they see you here, they're going to learn how important it is to be faithful to church because you're the older brothers and sisters in the family of God. What, one of our uh, relatively new uh, members, uh, his name is Alan. He's awesome. Love Alan. He's got a great heart for the lost, a great heart for God. He came to me just after he got in the church. It was within the first few months. He said, Pastor, what in the world am I supposed to do with all this extra time? And I looked at him. I said, what? Because I don't hear that very much. I hear, you know, all the stressed out Pentecostals. Oh, we go to church here? Oh. Alan said, what am I going to do with all this extra time? I said, what do you mean? He said, we only have church on Wednesday night, Saturday night, Sunday morning, and Sunday night. Now, pastor, what am I supposed to do with all this extra time? When I was in the world, I went to the club every night of the week. I was out till all hours. Now, what in the world am I supposed to do with all that? And I thought, wow, I like you. <laughs> got around some people that loved the house of God. They just put that all over him. And uh, he got around some people that every time the doors are open, they're just there. And every time the, the, the worship just kind of breaks loose, they're in the altar. And so Alan's in the altar. And I love that. But he learned that. He wasn't 
He didn't come into the church doing that. He came into the church shell-shocked. He'd never been in anything quite like that before. Uh, he, he'd never seen anything quite like that before. But that's how this happens. And I can tell in this church, because you've got a multi-generational church here, I can tell that you're doing a great job of passing this down from one generation to another, to another, to another. And that's the way it should be as we look at our older brothers and sisters. So let me get a little more specific tonight. Um, when they look at you, they don't just need to see worship. They don't just need to see faithfulness and attendance. They don't just need to see faithfulness and giving. They don't just need to see that you go to the altar. And by the way, how does a new convert learn that the best place in the world for them is to get to the altar every service? They learn by looking at us. And when the altar call is given, we need to be in the altar, folks. And I haven't been here for an altar service, so I'm working blind here. So no, nobody told me anything. And if that convicts you, you're welcome. But we need to be in the altor. Uh, I, I pastor a few people that, my goodness, they're, they're like spiritual lone rangers. They talk in tongues and walk around and wave their hands. But when the altar call is given and we're all praying for people and praying for people to get the Holy Ghost, they're like AWOL. They're sitting in the back talking. Uh, you know what? That isn't a good example for an older brother or sister in the family of God. We need to be in the altar. If, if you've got health and strength, we need you. Uh, if you can't find a new person or a, a sinner to pray for, grab a hold of one of us and pray for us because we can use it. But that's important. That's how we learn. But that's not all they need to be learning. They need to be learning about holiness from us. New members in our church need to learn. And we need to exhort one another and encourage one another. If your exposure to Pentecost has been somebody that kind of slides under the radar of what pastor preaches, and they kind of always live a little less than he preaches, and they kind of do their own thing and think, well, I can just get away with that. I'm sorry. I apologize to you that that's been your exposure to Pentecost. Because there are those kind of people around. But the, what, what you should be exposed to, what you need to look for, don't attach yourself to somebody that's lukewarm and use them for a pattern. Don't attach yourself to somebody that doesn't live what pastor preaches and use them as your example. Attach yourself to some faithful saint of God that's weathered some trials and weathered some tests and they live this faithfully and they live this openly and they're not ashamed of it. That's the pattern that you need. And so, folks, we need to be teaching our wonderful new people. We need to be teaching our younger believers about this thing called holiness. They are not going to learn that because we holler it at them. They are not going to learn that even because pastor or brother Woodward comes and gives a message in the pulpit. That's not how they're going to learn it the best. Here's how they're going to learn it. They're going to watch you. You say, I don't know if I'm comfortable with that. Get comfortable with it. Follow me as I follow Christ. If there's something in your life that you don't want them to know about or see, you need to get rid of that. Right. Don't get rid of them following you. Get rid of that so they can follow you. This is serious business, this holiness thing. Uh, we, we can't have patterns. We can't have mentors. We can't have... Uh, leaders, We can't have people we look up to in our lives. We can't have people that are just kind of doing this as a profession or just kind of doing this on the surface or just kind of doing this part-time or on Sundays. We need, if we ever needed it, we need an apostolic generation to rise up that's not ashamed to worship yes. and not ashamed to pray and not ashamed to be different. No, I'm not just on my soapbox. But when I see what the devil is trying to push down our throats, yeah. it makes something in me rise up and say, Devil, if you can push sin and sewage and garbage down our throat and call it okay, then surely we can stand up and say, No, we're a holy people. We're not an arrogant people, yeah. we are a holy people. stands up and says, yes, but Pastor Raymond, 
Um, have you never read this scripture? This is the one they always go to. It's their defense. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2 verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Verse 9. Not of works, lest any man should boast. See there, Pastor Raymond? I'm not saved by what I do, so I don't have to listen to you. I don't have to do all this stuff that you call holiness. My, my lifestyle doesn't have to be different than the world. I don't have to act different, talk different, dress different, uh, do my entertainment choices different. I don't have to because I'm not saved by any of that. I'm saved by grace through faith. It's not of works. There. I'm going to sit here in my hammock and sip lemonade and relax until Jesus comes back. Hmm. And they look at me with that kind of strange look like, there, I guess I stumped you. And I always tell them exactly the same thing. It never varies. I always just say, ever read the next verse? Because the next verse, verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So once again, We've got this thing that in North American Christianity has been taken out of context. I'm not saved by works. True. But not complete. I'm not saved by what I do. I'm saved by what Jesus did. Thank God for Calvary. Thank God for an empty tomb. Thank God for the triumph of Jesus' yes. sacrifice. So no, you're right. 100%. I'm not saved by works. But don't stop at verse 9. Read it in context. I'm not saved by good works, but once I am saved, the rest of my life, I'm created unto good works. So once I am saved, God does have good works that he expects me to do and ways that he expects me to live. That's no different than what you did in your family. Uh, when, when your kids were little, you taught them to feed themselves and to do other things for themselves. Thank God you taught them. And so they grew up. When, when Matthew was home and he was uh, two years old, three years old, he didn't ask him to take out the trash. When he was still home and he was 16 years old, 17 years old, he could ask to take out the trash every week just about. We didn't love him less when he was 16 or 17. In fact, we loved him more. He'd now been with us another uh, 13, 14 years. We loved him more than we did. We, we, we raised that boy. But when he was 16 or 17, if dad said, Matt, take out the trash and if dad got attitude we would say in our house what you say in your culture Houston we have a problem <laughs> why because he was more mature and as you grow more mature in the things of God God has higher expectations for you that's right that's why pastor is right when he's loving and nurturing and caring and being so careful and kind to those new babies in Christ. He's like, they get away with murder. No, they don't. They're just little. They're just new. They're just coming out of a world of sin. Give them a break. That was you 20, 10 years ago. That was you 30 years ago. That was you 50 years ago. So, so cut them some slack. And we're going to love them. And, and we're not going to holler stuff at them. And we're not going to enforce rules on them. We're just going to teach them. And furthermore, we're going to let them watch you. That's right. And if they watch you and you're living for God and loving it, they will get this and they will do this. That is the most important component of a revival church. Now, you've all met the Pentecostal police, I'm sure. Maybe they're only in Canada, too. The Pentecostal police are, are, are those people, they, it's kind of like they have a flashing red light on their hairdo, and they pull up against somebody right in the foyer, and they, they pull them over, and they let them have it. You're not doing this, and you should be doing this, and you shouldn't do that, and you blah, 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 blah. They pull them over and write them a ticket. And their whole attitude is, bless God, if I've had to do this for 40 years, you're going to have to do it. <laughs> Number one, that is not holiness. That's right. I don't know what it is, but it's not holiness. If you've ever been pulled over by one of those people and they wrote you a ticket and told you everything you weren't doing, you'll notice that your pastor didn't do that. You'll notice that the wonderful elders and saints in this church didn't do that to you. And so if you get a few of those, they're probably like vacationing from Canada or something. Just ignore them. Because here's how this works. As we grow, when they watch you and you're living holy and you're living godly and you're loving God and loving life 
and, and, and you're blessed and you're happy and you've got something to worship yes. God about, they look at that and say, man, that's not the way my life is. I need to be more like that. And that's the point. You are an example of the believers. Yes. Amen. Follow me as I follow Christ. Amen. And that's so right. that's the goal of people in a church is to mature all of these believers that God is bringing to us. And they, they it's better caught than taught. If there's a Holy Spirit, then holiness, there's a spirit of holiness. And a spirit of holiness doesn't give you a list of rules. A spirit of holiness gets in you until you know by the Holy Ghost. You, you go to move in a direction and the Holy Ghost taps you on the shoulder and says, uh-uh, don't do that. You remember last time, that'll hurt you. And if you'll listen to that, that's how you grow in holiness. That's right. Now, let, let me uh, just kind of anchor this down, and uh, I won't be much longer. Four or five hours will wrap me up solid. So we're good. Some of you aren't quite sure that's a joke. <laughs> God gives us different holiness teachers in our lives. The first holiness teacher you have in your life is right here. It's the Holy Bible. And so if the Bible says don't do it, or if the Bible says that's an abomination to God. Or if the Bible says God's displeased by that. That's what we go by. Yes. That's our first holiness standard. That's a Bible standard. And a Bible standard we just adopt and accept and we give it. And we don't resent it or reject it. Or try to worm our way around and looking for a loophole. But there's another kind of holiness teacher that God's put in your life. And he's sitting right over there. That's right. Your spiritual leadership. That's right. Because the Bible doesn't give us a thou shalt not for everything we encounter in life. There is no scripture in the Bible. Thou shalt not look at pornography on the internet. Mostly because the internet didn't exist when the Bible was written. But there are many principles in the Bible. I've made a covenant with my eyes. I will set no evil thing before my eyes. Search me, O oh God. Cleanse me. See if there be any wicked way in me. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Whatsoever things are good and pure, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. So there's all kinds of principles. So every once in a while, your man of God will rise and stand in this pulpit, in a Bible study perhaps, or in a service, and he'll preach the word of God. And he'll say with passion and conviction, this is what we need to do. Don't you dare look for a loophole around his voice. That's right. Because he's your second holiness teacher, your spiritual leadership. And, and, and Paul did that. Paul said, this speak I, not the Lord. Paul said, I speak this by permission and not of commandment. What are you saying, Paul? I'm saying this, that we're facing an issue here in Corinth, and I need to deal with it, and I need to give you some advice as your pastor, and as your elder, and as the apostle who started and who led this church. I need to give you some advice, and you need to do it. He expected them to do it. And so that's your second kind of holiness teacher. You've got the Bible. You've got your spiritual leadership, and then you have a third kind of holiness teacher that is the most important in your life. It's the Holy Ghost living inside of you. The Holy Ghost knows you like nobody else. There is no human being close enough to you to know you. Not even your spouse, not even your parents, not even your children or your siblings. There's nobody close enough to you in this world to know you like the Holy Ghost knows you. So if you learn that every once in a while the Holy Ghost will say, don't do that. Every once in a while, the Holy Ghost will say, stay out of there. Every once in a while, the Holy Ghost will say, don't go with those people to that place. You know what went on in your mind the last time you went there. You know what happened in that conversation the last time you had a conversation about that subject. So stay away. And if we'll learn, the Holy Ghost isn't given to us to make us dysfunctional or psychotic or double-minded or schizophrenic. The Holy Ghost is given to us to keep us living holy lives before God. And the Holy Ghost knows where you've been tempted and where you've fallen and where you fail. And that's by the holiness that you've got to learn to listen. And the Holy Ghost is never going to tell you live less than what pastor is teaching. The Holy Ghost is never going to tell you you can ignore that verse in the Bible. The Holy Ghost is never going to tell you just let 
live and slide. The Holy Ghost loves you too much. And so the Holy Ghost will teach you. And the Holy Ghost will instruct you. Young people, I see so many young people in this room. And I'm so thrilled to watch them worship tonight. Young people, the greatest thing you can ever learn to do is listen to the still, small voice of the Holy Ghost in you. And when all your friends are putting pressure on you to do this, and the media is saying that's normal, and that's not only accepted, but now it's almost expected, and it's almost championed, and we make heroes out of those people. And in a world like that, you got to learn to listen to the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost will say, no, not you. That's not for you. Stay away from that. And you need to learn to listen. It will bless your life. So really what this is all about is we, we have three kinds of standards in our life. We have uh, Bible standards. That's from our first holiness teacher. If you cross over a Bible standard, you've now moved into sin and you suffer the judgment of God. It's like standing at a fence on the edge of the Grand Canyon. You go past the fence and you're in trouble. You're in disaster. So that's a Bible standard. And then we have our spiritual leadership that teaches us church standards. Because not everything is specified in scripture. And your pastor may have wonderful things to teach you about how we interact with the internet. Or how we interact with culture. Or how we interact with this or that issue right here in North Carolina. And you need to listen to the man of God. My pastor, uh, he says often, if I teach you something and your pastor teaches something different and it's just a difference of opinion or a difference of conviction within the word of God, if I teach it and your pastor teaches something different, your pastor's right and I'm wrong. You need to learn to submit to your pastor. You don't have any obligation to submit to me. I'm just a guy that was privileged to be invited to Lumberton for one weekend. You are not responsible to submit to me. You are responsible to submit to the man of God and teaches, you and teaches you and cares for you and shepherds you and that's called the church standard that's right. and church standards are where the Bible doesn't say thou shalt not but your pastor backs up a couple steps and he says I think we're going to put a fence here and we're going to put a fence here on how our families interact with media. We're going to put a fence here on how we do this or how we do that. What's he doing? He's keeping you from getting too close to the edge and breaking the laws of God. So don't resist that or chafe at that. And I got to tell you, there's a lot of people that live insane lives as Christians because they know all of this. They know that churches make uh, standards and they say this is how we should live. And, and, and they know that there's Bible standards. And they literally say, well, I don't agree with pastor and I don't think that scripture applies to today. So I'm going to put my personal standard way down here in the Grand Canyon. After I've already fallen and broken my neck and my back and both legs, I'm going to be down here. That's stupid. Amen. That's not how you live for God. That's the right. personal standards. What are personal standards? Personal standards are where God convicts you about something. And, and it might not even be in the Bible. Right. And it might not even be something the pastor teaches. But the Holy Ghost, who loves you and knows you, and knows your temptation zones, and knows where you've fallen and messed up, the Holy Ghost will whisper in your ear. He'll tap you on the shoulder and say, no, don't do that. Right. Right. I pastor people that will not go. Uh, the whole church could go. They, they won't go to a place where there's a, a, a an open bar in the center of a restaurant. So even something like an Applebee's or any place that has an open bar, they won't go there. That's their conviction. That's a personal conviction. I don't have that conviction. I could go there. I could lay on the bar and you could pour beer over me all night long and I wouldn't be tempted. I've never had a drink of alcohol in my life. So that's not a temptation. But they have a temptation. Right. And it's places like that where they got into sin and one drink led to two and two led to ten and ten led to a lifetime of alcoholism and they wrecked their marriage and cheated on their spouse in a place like that. And so every time they go there, that comes washing over them. And so I don't make fun of them. Oh, you're so weak. You can't even go to Apple. I don't make fun of them. I honor them that they cherish the Holy Ghost so much that they will put on themselves a higher back way up here and say, here's my fence, because I'm tempted when I go there. So even if the whole church goes, I'm not going to condemn them. I'm not trying to be super spiritual. But I just know for me, if I go there, that's a problem. That's right. I don't make fun of those people. I don't call them weak. I admire people like that, that love God so much that they would inconvenience themselves. And they would kind of look like an oddity, maybe even to the rest of us. 
But they're not trying to be arrogant or super spiritual or, you know, they're not trying to be self-righteous. They just sincerely cherish what God has done in them. I, I'm, I'm coming in for a, a landing. Now, sometimes the airport's a ways in the distance, but I am coming in for a landing. <laughs> I think one of the most important things we need to remember, and one of the things that sets the apostolic church apart, and if you're new at, at POL, I, I want to tell you that uh, we've got all kinds of time. Remember, we're born into the family, and you're just as much part of the family as somebody that's been here for 50 years. So we've got all kinds of time for you to grow. And if you've never heard some of this stuff before because you're new, uh, don't you feel that it's it's presented in a way that's condemning you or whatever? we got all kinds of time. We love you. You're part of the family. And, and so we got time for you to, to learn this, and we got time for you to grow into this, and, and you don't have to worry about, oh my goodness, now i, I got to do all this. You just have to follow the Lord and, and let God lead you. Amen. One, one, of my, uh, one of my favorite pastoral moments with new converts was this little girl who uh, came into our church, and she was a party girl at college. And that was kind of the sad thing about her life, because I don't know how many times that little girl was used and abused and messed up in relationships. It took us a while to kind of work with her through all of that stuff. But she came in, she got the Holy Ghost, she got baptized in Jesus' name, and then one day she kind of bounced into the office, because that's what she does. She's kind of high energy. She bounced into the office, and she talks kind of fast. And she said, and I quote, Pastor, I've been looking around and all these ladies wear dresses. Do I have to wear a dress? Because if I have to wear a dress, I want to wear a dress. But if I don't have to wear a dress, I don't want to wear a dress. Because I've never worn a dress. In fact, I don't even own a dress. So, Pastor, do I have to wear a dress? <laughs> End of quote. And I looked at her. And I said exactly the same thing I would say to you or anybody else that asked me that question. I said, no. You don't have to wear a dress to come here. You don't have to dress any different than what you dress right now to come here. We love you. We're so proud of you. We're thankful you've been born again. But here's some scriptures. Why don't you go read these scriptures and when God speaks to you, come on back and talk to Pastor. It wouldn't have been six weeks. I don't even think it was anywhere near that long. It might have been a month. She comes bouncing into the office. <laughs> said, Pastor, Pastor, Pastor. Notice anything? <laughs> I said, uh, glasses? No! Your hairstyle? No! I said, oh, you're wearing a dress? She said, yes! She said, I saw it in the Bible. She said, but I'm going to write a book. It's going to be called Skirt Adventures. <laughs> Pastor, did you know that you can't really run upstairs really fast when you're wearing a long full skirt? <laughs> she said, Pastor, did you ever know that when you're wearing a long full skirt and you get into the car, you have to be very careful about shutting the car door? Did you know that? <laughs> she said, well, you do. She said, but don't worry, Pastor. I did rip the whole side of my skirt, but I had duct tape and I fixed it. <laughs> <laughs> And she bounced her little self out of the office and went off to whatever service we were having. And I sat there for a minute and thought, that's the way it should be. Amen. That people do this out of joy and out of responding to God and obeying the scripture. And not because we force them to, but we make them feel less than us until they do. We just love people. At whatever age or stage you're at, we love you. You can't change that. We already love you. And, and if you've been born again, that's what puts you in the church, not joining uh, a particular fellowship or fellowship.